um, and with our standard COVID opening. So in keeping with Oregon public meetings law, statutory land use hearing requirements and Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding this meeting virtually. All members of the PSC are attending remotely and the city has made several avenues available for the public to watch the broadcast of this meeting. The PSC is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, humor, flexibility and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. And with that, I will see if there's any items of interest from commissioners. I see Steph. Just quickly, welcome Valeria. Thank you. Welcome Valeria. Um, if you, are you able to put your screen? You don't have to, but if you are, that's fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. And I'll, um, well, question. Um, any other items of interest? Okay, I'm going from memory here. So I think we'll next go to consent agenda. Do we have one of those? I don't have my agenda in front of me, unfortunately, where I am. For the minutes for the last meeting, typically? Move approval of the minutes. Thank you. I'll second it if you need seconding. Thank you, Katie, for a second. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. All right, the minutes are approved. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kat. And, and for now, we'll move on to our sole topic for today's meeting. Um, oh, hold on. There was one item of interest I thought that, Jeff, are you going to bring up something here about the housing supply? I, I was prompted that there might be a. a, a, a oh, okay, I, I, I failed to know. I was the one that that was supposed to prompt it, but I will go ahead. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if this was discussed at the offices or not, but there's been some discussion about planning commission taking some kind of action or some kind of briefing or some kind of in, uh, to, to address, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of public, uh, media coverage lately about housing problems in the city. We're, we're well behind on our housing, on what we should be producing in terms of housing. I'm gonna ask for one minute while I shut my door to stop a barking dog. Steph, I'll try to bring her in later. So uh, the idea is trying to discuss some kind of an appropriate venue, perhaps the Planning Commission could stage to kind of take a look at this issue, raise awareness, bring some experts in to discuss it. There's a very good article in the Oregonian today, pretty detailed and pretty well balanced. And I guess if people haven't read it, I'd ask staff to maybe send it out. Tom, I see you nodding. Maybe if you could make sure that happens. It really kind of laid out the issues, uh, had a pretty balanced take on what are some of the causes of the, of the problem. And basically the problem is housing production has declined rather dramatically in the city over the last few years. That's in comparison to you know, Washington County, Hillsborough, Beaverton, the suburbs, that's in comparison to other cities uh, of similar size to Portland. And so the question is, that's a problem. What are some of the causes? Are there some things the city, some things the Planning Commission could be doing or thinking about to, to address it? And so the, there's been a little bit of discussion. Eli and I have talked, I've talked to some other folks about Maybe this would be a great opportunity to do something the Planning Commission hasn't really done in my time, but we've all, many of us have talked about, which is sort of having a, a more public briefing, bring in some experts, discuss the issue, and see if we can come up with some things that either we as a Planning Commission to, could do, or we would recommend the city do, or if nothing else, uh, air, air an important public issue. All right, thank you. And I, heard, I know that Ben was unable to attend this meeting, but he, um, through his professional work, um, has been hearing similar stories of companies looking for um, opportunities to develop affordable, develop housing um, outside of Portland, because for whatever reason, they're looking elsewhere. Um, so that, that's kicked out to officers, perhaps, as a way to discuss and see if there's a format we could um, look at at the PSA. Do people have other thoughts on this topic? Before we, um, sort of shunted to the officers? Okay, 
not hearing it, let's move to our main topic for today. Um, the, um, I, I have put up a new um, photo now. I am actually in Capitol Reef National Park. Um, we spent the day with the family here and we'll be spending the next two days day hiking and then backpacking after that. So we're excited. And then from there to Cedar Mesa um, and then back to home to Portland. Um, so Mike, Garrett came really close, but Escalante is awesome too. Yeah. I will um, ask if anyone has any items of interest, sorry, um, any disclosures to make related to the Historic Landmarks um, Commission, um, the Historic Resources Code Project. Any disclosures? I know we have one because Kristen always gets us one of them, but let's, let's do that quickly. Yeah. Sure, I can start. Thanks, Eli. Um, I'm Kristen Miner. I'm the chair of the Landmarks Commission um, and welcome to your new commissioner. Um, so I have, yeah, so I have a couple declarations. One of them, I live in Irvington, um, which is a designated historic district. And the second one is that um, in my professional life, I have put a number of, um, of city owned as well as just, uh, you know, other sit within the city of Portland properties on the National Register. Thank you. Um, and now I'll turn it over to um, Brandon Spencer Hartle to guide us through our last work session on this before we actually get um, staff written specific code amendments to, to deal with. So this will be straw polling today, I believe, and maybe some looking ahead, um, but we'll actually save our, our voting on specific amendments until our next meeting on this. Brandon. That's right. Well, thanks, Chair Spivak and commissioners. Um, JP, I will be sharing my screen, so I, I may need screen sharing privileges. Um, and I know it's it's a really nice evening here, so we don't need to take the whole two hours if we don't need it. So we'll see how we can do. And today's topic is a continuation of the work sessions on the Historic Resources Code Project. Um, tonight is, is a fun one because we're closing out the PSC identified issues that were raised all the way back in November. And so what we'll do tonight is we're going to talk about the remaining PSC issues, one of which is a, a, a bucket of, let's say, explorative topics around potential future work. Um, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes when we get there. But but what we'd like to do is to start with, and I'll get to you, Mike, in just a second. Uh, what we'll do is we're going to start with those issues that were raised by um, commissioners related to the code specifically. So we're going to talk about code issues first up, um, and that will that will be a, a a return to issues that were identified back in. February or discussed back in February related to the code. And then we're going to talk about future work and the future work items that, that I put in the handout were related to those items raised by commissioners back in November. Um, Mike, you may be getting ahead of me. Mike and some other commissioners did raise issues that were unrelated to the code or, or sort of outside of the code. And so tonight would be the opportunity to talk about future work partnerships, opportunities to advance historic resources, protection, um, identification, collaboration, uh, to help inform the PSC letter to council, the revised staff report for these HRCP code amendments, and to give us some bearings about where the PSC uh, would hope that we go in the future and come back to you. So I'm going to stop there. We're going to work our way through the handout and then a sort of a structure I put together for the future work discussion, but I did see Mike had his commissioner hand up. Well, you may have been thinking about my concern about cultural landscapes, but actually I did submit an amendment regarding ADU size. And I couldn't remember, I didn't see that on the list and can't remember if we dealt with that or whether we'll vote on that later or what. Yeah, good good uh, question for the good of the order. We did address um, the size of allowed detached accessory structures on February 8th or 9th, I think February 9th. And we did have a commission's drop poll to the direct staff to bring back an allowed ADU size of 576 square feet um, by right without uh, historic resource review. So we will be drafting that amendment um, and discussing that at April 27th um, amendment package request discussion. So I think Mike, you had requested 700 square feet. And what I heard from the straw poll was, let's go with 576. Right. Okay, thanks. I'd forgotten that. Chair Spivak, any other commissioners have anything else to request or can we jump right in? All right, let's jump right in. So commissioners who were at the um, 
February meeting uh, may remember that there was a series of issues raised by Commissioners Spivak, Smith, and Bordalazzo related to the Historic Resource Review or sort of design review for historic areas, related to the Historic Resource Review process and approval criteria. Those three issues generally focused around height and floor area ratio and how those uh, elements of um, sort of established urban form are considered in the historic resource review process. Uh, we spent our March, I think it was March 16th, three by three discussion, uh, really focusing in on the zoning map, looking at each individual historic district and what's allowed in the zoning code um, for uh, height limits related to new construction or additions and alterations. So we looked district by district at, at the map. Um, we looked at unique considerations in the district, and we looked at recent historic resource review approvals for new buildings in those districts. Chair Spivak did join us for that discussion. And where we, where we went in the discussion was looking at areas where there may be a conflict or the likelihood of conflict when a new building is proposed that may be significantly larger than the historic buildings. Um, staff identified a total of 12 blocks citywide where there may be a, a likelihood of conflicts or a, a challenge in reaching compatibility for new buildings based upon the height of nearby contributing resources. But staff also identified some large swaths of the city with, where the established height limits may be at or below the height limits of the nearby contributing buildings. And so we see there's, there's uh, significantly fewer blocks now than there would have been a few years ago. Uh, where the allowed height limits are in great excess of nearby contributing resources, uh, in large part because of the Better Housing by Design and Central City 2035 projects, which provides height and FAR in those areas. But there are some large areas of the city where, where we have not gone back and taken a look at height and FAR in those areas. So after the three by three discussion um, and, and staff looking at the, the list of opportunities, constraints, challenges, um, staff would recommend against a code amendment to resolve issues related to height and FAR. But I do know that Chair Spivak and other commissioners have raised the question of whether or not there could be future work. And while we won't be able to, let's say, uh, guarantee a path forward on that, staff do think that the better approach here would be a, a map refinement project or projects. Uh, maybe they're opportunity-based or maybe they're um, district-based, uh, but did a, a review of the, the map is a is a more fruitful use of time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there. We did have a really good three by three discussion. I might turn it over to Chair Spivak um, and Chair Miner from Landmarks Commission to to fill in where I maybe left some gaps. But the staff recommendation would be to not move an amendment in the code. Chair Spivak, anything that you'd like to add? All right. Well, thank you. I. Um... I'm having stuttery. Sure, can you guys hear me? I'm having a little stuttering. You might give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. You sound good now. Looks like, okay, I'm gonna try this out um, and explore my view options so I don't use my too much bandwidth. Um, I um, support staff's recommendation on this. I feel like I had some concern over, um, the, the concern I had going into this um, proposed amendment idea was a few fairly small geographic areas of the city where it felt like, um, there was not an alignment between um, the base zone, um, which sometimes some of these locations are some of the parts of our city that are best served for transit walkability. And it felt like that might be um, butting up against um, discretionary review based on height or FAR. Um, I'm convinced that the best way to handle this is as staff recommends through a follow-up project to do some map refinement. Um, so I will leave it at that. Thanks, Chair Spivak. Were any other commissioners present at the three by three interested in, in adding context to this? Or no expert need if you don't want. Agreed. And as one of the original people who raised this, I'm I'm happy with that work plan. Kristen? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in and say that I'm also happy with, you know, kind of a future work map refinement project. I feel like it really gets down to focus in on those areas of concern. Um, you know, Brandon definitely gave a pretty good overview of the places where 
um, you know, my commission feels like we're doing a good job and the heights seem to be working pretty well. Um, so it's really just finding those areas where it's not working and looking at those together. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think if there's no other comments, let's go to the next topic. Great. Thanks, Chair Spivak. The next topic is, is, is a complicated one, so I'll do my best to, to give some insights into to what the, request, the requested uh, issue was and then how staff have, have responded. Um, Commissioner Ralph identified that in historic districts and conservation districts citywide, floor area ratio, so unused development potential, is not eminently eligible for transfer to other sites. We do allow the transfer of floor area from contributing buildings in historic and conservation districts in certain zones and from historic and conservation landmarks in certain zones. We did discuss this issue at the three by three two weeks ago. Staff went back and did a little more homework, talked at length with the code team and the Central City 2035 team. And based upon a few things that I'll describe in a minute, staff are reticent to move forward with an amendment that would open up FAR transfer to non-contributing sites in historic and conservation districts. The discussion when the three by three met was really looking at whether or not there was a uh, a need or an opportunity to allow new buildings that maybe don't maximize their allowed FAR or height, uh, the economic value of transferring FAR to a different site. So really thinking about new construction that voluntarily comes in lower than the allowed FAR for compatibility or has some, some headroom that hasn't been fully utilized. When we went back and looked at the decision-making matrix for the Central City 2035 plan, what staff uh, came to the conclusion of is that we do allow FAR transfers within a sector. So there are five subsectors in the central city. We allow FAR transfers within those sectors from, from any old building, non-contributing building in a district, a building that doesn't have any historic resource status, only after um, a receiving site has, has taken advantage of either the affordable housing uh, bonus transfer system, the historic resource transfer from a landmark or contributing building, or the open space bonus. And in the Central City 2035 deliberations and decisions, we were, we were pretty calculated in how we wanted to prioritize those transfers and why we landed at the time uh, on not allowing for transfers Central City-wide from non-contributing buildings. Outside of the Central City Plan District, we allow transfers in the mixed-use multi-dwelling and employment zones from landmarks and contributing buildings. But in general, those transfers are limited to a two mile radius around the contributing building or the landmark. And so the, the number of eligible sites for transfer is constrained. And as we looked at whether or not we could adopt a similar sector type program or a transfer program from non-contributing buildings, what we started to come to the conclusion of was that it would be a, a pretty big lift that we would need to really reconstruct how the FAR transfer and bonus system worked outside of the central city in a way that might parallel the central city. And so uh, there's receptivity certainly outside of the central city to come up with something that would allow for FAR transfer uh, from a non-contributing building. We did a, the quick back of the napkin on how many sites we'd be talking about. We're, it's, it's a pretty small number. I mean, it's in, the, it's in the low hundreds of how many sites would be eligible to transfer FAR from a non-contributing site. And so staff did want to bring that information back to the, to the full commission, to Commissioner Ralph, just to, to gauge whether or not there was the appetite for what would be a pretty big lift to reconstruct the FAR transfer uh, and, and priority systems. We also had to take a look at the testimony that was received on this issue, um, thinking that to find to get a sense of where that testimony was coming from. And what we found was predominantly the testimony related to the um, Old Town Chinatown Neighborhood Association. And when we looked at the central city uh, transfer provisions again, which, which were just readopted in, in summer 2020, we did identify that those non-contributing buildings could transfer their FAR. They wouldn't have the same prioritization as affordable housing or, or a historic building that's being seismically upgraded, but they did have the ability to transfer. So happy to talk more about it. Um, I know Commissioner Ralph is really interested in finding a, a path here. And so I'm curious what the commissioner and the full commission thinks about this approach. Um, thank you so much, Brandon, for all of uh, your your legwork on this um, and for the conversations and also appreciate the conversation at three by three uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, what I'm hearing from that is 
know, there's a pretty, pretty recent like quasi fix within the central city um, that hasn't really been tested. And, and I think that the other, the other I potential issues that um, I had heard or gleaned from testimony, especially as it relates to the, the future work that potential future work that we just discussed around looking at um, FAR in, um, in existing uh, historic districts, that that, that satisfies um, my hope, which was um, ensuring that there, you know, fairness and, and recognizing that, that uh, no chilling of any uh, potential development. I'd, I'd be delighted to hear what other people think who are um, more versed in development than I am. Anyone else would like to chime in on this? And I can better see your virtually raised hands than your physical raised hands. I'm trying to not use, I'm not seeing somebody. Um, so Steph, do you want to um, I mean, thanks for bringing this issue up. I think it will come again. Do you want to just move on to the next one? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Then, Brandon, take it away. Great. Thanks for coming back. So we're going to pivot. This is great. Thank you. We've now discussed all of the code-related issues from commissioners. So big lift. We've been working on it since November. And uh, we saved the best for last, which is the discussion of potential future work. Um, I did ask Tom to, to chime in here and help place this future work within the context of the Bureau's budget and capacity realities. Uh, something Chair Spivak had asked for that we, we sort of have the discussion of potential future work within the uh, reality check of where we're at as a city and where priorities lie. So I'll turn it over to Tom for a few minutes here just to kind of place us in context. Um, I will remind the commission and introduce our new commissioner to the, the sort of framework of what we do every day in the historic resources program, and then really open up a discussion of seven potential future work items and, and what that means and how it will inform the PSC's letter to council and potentially the Landmarks Commission's letter to council. So Tom, if you don't mind just kind of giving some context here for the discussion tonight. Sure, thanks, Brandon. Um, Tom Armstrong, I'm a supervising planner at BPS. Um, and up until last July, supervised the um, urban design and historic teams that, that Brandon's a part of. And I guess just to give some context, you know, our urban design and historic team is currently three staff people. Um, it's been as many as recently as five staff people, um, depending on the resources and, and plus or minus a few interns. Um, but you know, over the over the long range, the historic program has really been one staff person, occasionally an intern, and all the grants that that Brandon is able to scrounge up and squeeze out of our program to put towards um, interns and consultants. Um, and and I guess and that is for a program that has to both do their own projects like the, the HRCP project, but also consult on other projects where historic resources are involved. Um, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, Brandon was involved in many of the discussions we had with the Better Housing by Design um, multi-dwelling code changes, um, the central city code changes, um, and other areas where historic resources are a piece of it. So um, we very much acknowledge uh, that our capacity is limited in this area and just wanted to have that inform, just like with our other planning programs, there's lots of good ideas out there. And what we really need direction on is more about priorities um, from you and you know, what, what are core services and, and what are high priorities that we should go seek other resources for, whether that's for from within the city or without the city. Um, and as I mentioned, Brandon's been pretty successful in bringing outside grants um, to support some of this work. And so if we have some clear direction, um, you know, hopefully we, we know where to prioritize. 
through this conversation. Thanks, Tom. So what we'll do next, and again, we can we can spend as long or as little time as we need, but we do have issues that were raised by commissioners related to potential future work. Again, I, the primary purpose of this discussion is to inform the commission's letter to city council that will accompany these code updates. And so we did hear from members of the public and commissioners about um, the wish list of policy, technical mapping, community priorities that, that did not fit within the scope of the project. Uh, but that there was a desire to have a discussion um, at the end of the kind of end of the line of the code amendment discussions about um, what else would PSC like to see come back before you uh, direct staff work out in the community. It's just really is to inform primarily your letter to council and then secondarily our staff report updates. Um, I did mention in the email that went out on Friday, staff did identify a short list of items in the proposed draft staff report. We will refine that in the recommended draft staff report following today's discussion about where those priorities may be. And as Tom mentioned, there's, there's no certainty that these are issues that we can act on quickly or, or even in the medium term, but having a sense of those priorities will be really helpful. Um, Chair Miner from the Landmarks Commission is here today and the Landmarks Commission did spend a good deal of time on March, I think it was March 12th, um, doing their own discussion about future work. And I think they have a, a good long list, some of which is um, germane to this commission, some of which is germane to the Landmarks Commission's work. And so I know Chair Miner has some thoughts. And we used time at the three by three discussion uh, last week just to kind of pick a top eight that we might start with tonight for discussion. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna remind all of you and our new commissioner about what it is that we're doing currently and um, where we may be going in the not so distant future. Um, so in terms of our ongoing work, I think many of you know this, but again, for the, the benefit of those who are listening in our new commissioner, uh, BPS coordinates with our, our regional and state partners on proposed uh, regulatory changes, on uh, changes in state admin rules, legislative proposals. We work closely with uh, BDS on the um, sort of the, the care and feeding of our landmarks commissioners to ensure the landmarks commission has updated information, briefings, and, and the, the sort of pipeline of knowledge about policy discussions that they need. Uh, the, the program also provides public information, including maps, data, expertise. So any historic resource information related to uh, where landmarks are located, some of the discussions we had a few weeks back about how people can find information is, is really a BPS function to keep the maps current, to keep the data out there and available. And then as Tom mentioned, we do have the occasional grant funded special project that could look like a technical study, a survey of a historic resource um, or a series of historic resources or some community driven work that, that may be a, a one off or a special opportunity. And then as we've talked about updating district specific design guidelines. Currently, um, my work program and the historic resources program uh, workload looks like these code amendments sort of the critical path of, of making sure our code is up to date and that it's compliant with state admin rule, it's actionable, it resolves issues that have been identified by Bureau of Development Services and Landmarks Commission. So working through the code amendments. We are also um, getting close to the end of our um, process on updating the South Portland Historic District Design Guidelines. That was a grant funded project uh, that did engage a community advisory group to update uh, what served today as the oldest approval criteria in the city guidelines that date back to 1980 to allow for um, a variety of improvements to the review of new construction and alteration projects in South Portland. So that is a project that's um, well on its way and expected to go to city council sometime later this year. Also providing technical expertise to real development projects that are being advanced by the county and by different city agencies. Mentioned early on, we've done a multi-year effort to designate um, African-American historic resources. And so we're currently in the process of working with three um, black owned or black occupied properties on new national national register landmark designations. We have a, a Montevilla Main Street survey that could populate the historic resource inventory following these code amendments. And then more recently, a small one off, we've been looking to provide uh, technical guidance on reuse of the city's collection of Belgian block cobblestones. So sort of a wide variety of stuff going on in addition to the code amendments that fit within the Bureau's priorities and fit within our role collaborating with other state and um, state agencies and, and city bureaus. 
There were three issues raised by commissioners uh, in the first pass of um, commissioner issues. I know, I know Commissioner Howe had an additional issue related to cultural resources that I think we can talk about in a, in a minute here in, in the right area. Uh, but the three that were submitted early on from commissioners uh, raised questions about historic district design guidelines, preservation of living resources, and opportunities to advance justice in historic resource programs. Um, Commissioner Bordelazzo and Magnera are not here, it looks like. And so what I propose to do, and since they're not here, I think we'll just do it, is to discuss these three issues in the context of the eight related issues that were identified by the three by three for, for the initial discussion tonight. So each of these we'll, we'll come back to. Um, and so this was sort of our starting point for discussion at the three by three. And so the seven ideas that were raised at the three by three by Landmarks Commission members and PSC members, not that this is an exhaustive list and not that each of these are a priority, but the ones I wanted to spend some time talking about tonight just to, to find us priorities and to influence the, the letters that we go to council are zoning map refinements. So looking at areas on the map where we either have zone designations that uh, are in great excess or are conservative given the historic resources of areas looking at underrepresented histories and the work that the city has looking forward, but where we prioritize designations. Updates to the historic resource inventory, which could, could include and would naturally include uh, the identification designation of underrepresented histories, district specific guidelines and standards, legacy business and cultural district programs with this, which the city of Portland does not today have, um, the idea of a historic resources strategic plan, and then the ongoing collaboration between the Landmarks Commission and the PSC. And so that's where we're going to take the discussion tonight. There will be other items that, that don't fall on this list, but for the starting point, this is where we, the three by three wanted us to start. And to do so, uh, we wanted to start with the zoning map refinements. And again, we're talking about, you know, pie in the sky, what we would like to do. And we heard a couple things, the three by three. Um, one, that there may be some areas of the city where the, the existing height allowances and FAR allowances are um, more generous than is likely to be uh, readily approved through the design guidelines that apply to a district. We identified, like I said, about 12 blocks. And then other areas where the, the existing zone designations may be too conservative and primarily looking at the single dwelling zones that exist in Kings Hill, uh, Historic District, Irvington, and Lads Edition. Also in this map refinement discussion is something that was brought up early on in our conversations, which is reevaluating the level of designation and protection for specific districts. Following these code amendments, there will be a, a process to reevaluate um, whether or not districts uh, should become, or whether or not districts should be regulated at the historic level or the conservation level or the national register level. These code amendments provide the opportunity to scale the protections for places against other comprehensive plan goals and policies and the significance of the resource. And then last, an idea that there are some districts that the boundaries may be, um, boundary of those districts may be in need of refinement based around building demolition, future or previous research um, and sort of potential future conflicts with development. So I'm gonna stop there. I know uh, Chair Spivak has, has several thoughts on, on map refinements. I know Chair Minor does as well, uh, but I just wanted to put everything in these buckets for us to discuss tonight. Thank you, Brandon. And do you imagine us discussing these one at a time, or do you want to introduce them all and then have a prioritization discussion? My, my thought, if it works for you, and, and feel free to depart from it, is that we discuss each of them and then at, at the end decide which ones are maybe most of interest to the PSC or highest priority, and if we missed anything, what that is. Okay. Um, well, I will um, ask Chair Minor, do you want to jump in on this one first? Sure, yeah. Um, as, I, as I think I mentioned a little earlier, when Brandon came to the three by three discussion, um, he, he really focused in on the areas where, um, you know, we, we might see bigger challenges in getting to, in getting to yes. Um, but he also pointed out some areas that um, there have been recent map refinements. In other words, um, mostly height reductions in some areas. And, and so he was able to show a, a fair number of projects that we've 
recently approved, and by recently, I mean in the last two to three years, um, that met those height, um, those height maximums. So I think, um, you know, it, it really does take, you know, sort of looking at each area in, in a, you know, in a, in a focused way. Um, you know, I don't necessarily want to get into each district because they're all different. Because, but for instance, the um, the Grand Avenue Historic District, um, it has the benefit of having you know one of the highest buildings on the east side, which is you know the Weatherly in the middle of it, and yet you know the rest of the district is these sort of you know one to maybe four story, and so it's sort of finding how you can sculpt a building to really respect the Weatherly building, but you know allow for greater height certainly than you know the majority of those buildings. So I think the um, it's it's going to definitely take looking at each district in turn and sort of deciding how you know how to make sure that um, the heights allowed are something that can be potentially met. You know, I think the way Brandon put it was you know set them a couple of floors higher than you know most of the contributing buildings. And you know, see if see if we can get there through design, and that so far has seemed to be working. So I guess you know that's really all I all I have to say on that. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, uh, Katie, why don't you join first? Yeah, I just one of the things I was wondering is how long are these different um, projects going to take? Um, that would make a difference to me. Um, and uh, just something that is in my mind, so I'll just say it, it doesn't necessarily relate to this particular one, but I think it might, is that um, what I've noticed is for when there's established areas that are, um, you know, it's like, okay, these are these are historic districts that have already been set up. We really actually want to look for other historic districts that are more representative of who we are. But since these are already set up and they need this work, you're gonna put time and attention into those ones because they need the work, but it's not necessarily where you want to put your time and attention. And um, so I don't know how to get around that, but that happened in East Portland around parks. The parks needed all needed to be upgraded and, and they needed a lot of, uh, they had a lot of deferred maintenance. So uh, money was always going into the deferred maintenance on parks in established parts of the city, instead of looking at East Portland and seeing where do new parks go in. So I guess that's, that's something that I've been, you know, I'm kind of looking at these things feeling a little rebellious, kind of like, hmm, is this where we want to put our energies? So um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Katie, good point. Um, and we'll, as we prioritize these things, we'll, that'll come up more. Um, I, for the reason I, I had an aha moment back when we were doing the central city plan, I think when we were talking about, I shared this with the three by three or three by four, um, that when we were looking at the Grand Avenue corridor and we were talking about, should we make that maximum hype 120 or 150 or maybe higher? And then someone pointed out to me that it doesn't matter where we set it. Landmarks is gonna review the property and they're gonna approve whatever height they, um, they have discretion over that and they do. Um, and, and then I started looking around at the map, and that's where I got the you know, north side of um, Broadway is the south. Um, it's, it feels like some of these incredibly rich pedestrian amenities within walking distance of downtown that maybe um, the depression and the massive public investment in those areas that we should have people living there. We should make it easy to do development there because that's where um, it's a walkable part of our city. Um, so that's the area, that's my interest is, is refining on this project is to look at the areas that we've already designated. And I, I Katie made a great point about where do you put staff time? Um, but I feel like there's some areas within walking distance of downtown that these current, um, current um, historic landmark um, districts um, prevent some development in a place where we kind of need to have it um, in the closed-in central city. Um, 
and, and that a, a code refinement project might be one way of, of surgically adjusting maybe the boundaries, maybe make part of it a conservation district instead of a storage district or, um, or something like that that would allow some development to happen um, at those um, specific locations. Um, Katie, back to you. Oh yeah, I just, I asked that question and then I followed it with something. So I never got an answer to that question, which was how, how much are these, you know, oh, these, these take two weeks or <laughs> two years or, you know, maybe, that sort of thing. Tom or Brandon, do you want to, maybe on this one and maybe on others as we go forward, um, give us an idea of how much time it takes. I'll let Tom jump in after me and, and add to it since Tom has overseen more of these projects. I, I think it depends on the this, this scope. So if we're going to look at every historic district and every block, that's a that's a that's a big um, zoning map project. If there's a tar if there's one district or there's a targeted area in a district, it's still a big project. It's a legislative procedure that would come before the planning commission with the recommendation to council. But if there, I think this is to, to quote. Chair Spivak, if there were a hot spot or hot spots, it's a much narrower approach. And so if it was a handful of blocks, one district, part of a district, um, it's still a legislative procedure. It might be best packaged with a few other things since we're coming to PSC and coming to council. Uh, that's a different scope than if we're relitigating every district that's out there. Tom, Sorry. anything else you'd add? Uh, newbie question. Um, do I just raise, I don't see a button to raise my hand. Do I just speak or do I message chairs feedback that I want to speak? Sorry, I just don't see like the raise your hand function. Can someone help? Because uh, I actually can't participant? tell on my screen because I'm hosting, I can't raise my hand myself. Um, you oh. have under participants if you click on participants. Oh. You should be able to find okay. a okay. Raise your blue hand, and I forgot to put my blue hand down. Uh, so I'm gonna go do that. Okay, thank you. I thanks. Sorry. That's no, great. I, I will raise my hand to then speak, but they are little Maria. things like that that are that will just drive you nuts. So thank you for asking. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to chime in? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. I cut you off. Um, in, in, in responding, but I was just going to second um, to speed back. I think that actually, if we were to find or refine priority sections within this project, I would like to uh, look at the level of impact that these changes can make uh, for our communities here. So I completely agree. I think we should look at, you know, where development right now is having the hardest time to get in. Um, um, and also, yeah, and, and then like, I'm just thinking right now, you know, if I wouldn't prioritize like, for example, lots edition um, uh, over a couple of those downtown uh, sections that you have on the map, as well as MLK. I mean, I think those are really, really, key areas um, that potential changes would, I think, uh, make the most uh, impact. So I would think it from, yeah, um, impact perspective, that's how I would prioritize sort of like zoning into specific areas, um, or at least like a top three, if we were to go with this project. And maybe that would also sort of help with the timeline. Thank you. Yeah, and if anyone else has tech issues, I might have my own tech issues. I might disappear from the screen in a moment. Um, <laughs> please chime in. Um, so, um, Tom, do you want to weigh in on the um, resource side of this? Yeah, I mean, I I, um, I like the idea of of sort of the focus areas and and maybe starting with Brandon's maps where he identified the twelve blocks that where there may be a mismatch, you know, and or hearing from the, the Landmarks Commission about where they're having to make these difficult decisions about you know, where height in the zoning code is, is a lot hard, higher than the characteristics. And, and to Valeria's point, also like where are, is there opportunity? Is there sort of development capacity? Are we seeing a lot of interest and, and activity that would reduce these conflicts. So, so some sort of triage um, process to focus this. 
I also, you know, be wary of scope creep. And, you know, once we start the discussion, then, well, maybe we should update the design guidelines at the same time and do this issue over here. And, you know, these projects have a way of, of um, mushrooming and becoming bigger and bigger. So, um, again, I think this is a helpful discussion to see the entire range that helps us, you know, pick these um, hot spots out and weigh those against other areas. All right, thank you. Any other discussion on issue one before we move on? Okay, Brandon, let's go to the next one. Issue two is one that was raised by a number of commissioners. I think it's even been raised tonight. Um, and it is related to issue three, because as these code amendments move forward, we are, we are restructuring what the historic resource inventory means. And in the future, it will mean all designated landmarks and districts and those buildings that have been surveyed or documented for being historic. So it becomes a much bigger tent and a phrase that is used to describe a much bigger uh, list of resources than it does today. But one of the issues that, that's been raised by testifiers, I think it's resonated with both commissions, is to, to redirect and to prioritize um, underrepresented communities, underrepresented individuals in the city's history, and to make a push to have a much more inclusive and responsive list of historic resources citywide that are either just recognized and, and documented and that are designated with landmark or district protections. Uh, we are in the process of, of um, working with three individual sites on National Register nominations related to Black history, so those are ongoing. Uh, the Golden West Hotel, Mount Olivet Baptist Church, and the Dean's Barbershop and Beauty Supply, so really cool projects. Uh, there has been interest, and we are applying for a mid-sized grant, um, just it's opportunity-driven to continue uh, that work we've done and to use the model we did with the African American Historic Resources on LGBTQ plus resources, and so there's there's been interest internally. There's a, a somewhat of a unique grant opportunity to go after some funding on that. Um, and then there's also been a lot more interest in recent past history. So those communities who um, maybe are more recent arrivals to Portland over the last 50, 70, 30 years and looking at designations of uh, more recent social and cultural histories. So I will pause there. I know Chair Miner has um, a, a lengthy list of thoughts on this as I'm sure other commissioners do as well. Thank you. Um Chair Miner, do you want to kick this off? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when we started out this code project, this was one of the issues that I think we really wanted to see some work on. And the problem, um, the problem, of course, is that my commission doesn't decide what gets, you know, what gets listed or even what gets surveyed. You know, we're a reactive, you know, it's just set up to sort of react to whatever comes in, right? So it's the problem now is, you know, how can government step in? Because I guess, you know, that is what it takes to correct some of the problems of the past and to correct our focus to include many more of these, you know, non-white and underrepresented histories. Um, you know, we can only advocate so much. And so what I, what I really would love to see is a process that is not entirely top down, you know, and that's unfortunately a legislative process is kind of set up to be that way. And it's kind of set up to um, ensure that you know, the, the, the funding is sort of decides what gets covered and then, you know, there's, there's, you, you can sort of allocate those resources and that's somewhat as it should be. And yet we really need to engage the communities that haven't seen, you know, historic preservation work for them. We need to turn this around and we need to show that, um, you know, some of the areas of the city, not just, you know, within the sort of Albina corridor where urban renewal did its worst, but past 82nd, you know, some of these areas that have never been surveyed. And we need to, you know, we need to 
show these communities that they're really part of Portland and that their history matters. So I think our two commissions can really work on this and create a process that is more transparent and more inclusive and really start to, you know, I, I know there's funding issues now, you know, with both, you know, survey and designation, but as Brandon is doing right now, looking for sources of that funding, there are sometimes ways that, you know, we can bring in outside funding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, who would like to chime in on this one? I'm seeing Steph's hand up, Steph. Thank you. Uh, Tom mentioned scope creep before. So here you are. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess uh, one, one thing I keep coming back to is, you know, in the, the initial briefing uh, for Historic Resources Code Project, and, you know, it was on um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking like we're looking at designation of more recent social and cultural histories. And I just also want to be mindful that there was, um, there is history that long predates Portland as a city. And, uh, and just, I, I don't know where that fits. Um, I would like, uh, I would like us to remember that. And, and I would like us to be, be thoughtful and receptive to um, to where that fits in the historic reason. When does history begin um, uh, in our consideration? And and I also think, uh, especially you know, we look at the um, terrible um, events in, over the last week. You know, we also have a troubling history that um, we need to remember, and, um, and and I think that you know we need to be considering you know what does and the fact that Portland is the largest city in the only state in the union that uh, prohibited Black people from living here, and that 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 is also part of our history, and how do we bring that into um, into this conversation? Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, I think next we have um, Katie, and then Mike, and then Oriana. Yeah, um, this one really speaks to me. And um, I kept, when I was looking at the materials ahead of time, I was, I was kept thinking about the, um, I, the fair housing bus tour that um, had take that it ended. The one I took ended at, um, you know, sort of a nondescript area of. of I think it was southeast, maybe northeast um, Portland, and it was to show that uh, Mula uh, Geda Sarah and the fact that they have actually marked out on the street signs because so much of the um, so much of the history is hidden. Or it's just it's just hidden, and uh, or it's it's disappeared. And um, so that would be the kind of thing that I would be really interested in. And um, yeah, that's that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Mike. Yeah, a couple points uh, to Steph's comment. That's one of the things in my mind when I bring up cultural, uh, uh, the cultural landscape is there's a lot of work going on now with Metro and, and Portland Parks on re-indigenizing the landscape. Uh, Judy Bluehorse Skelton at uh, PSU's um, program, Indigenous Nation, Nation Studies program um, that's why I keep, that's one of the reasons there are others for bringing up cultural landscapes. And to Kristen's comment, I mean, that reflects um, the conversation that the Planning and Sustainability Commission has with regard to not being totally reactive, but being proactive. And I do think we need to figure out, and we're, there's a huge amount of interest in our commissions working together. And I'll uh, repeat what I frequently say, all of our work does not have to come in formal meetings. There are, I think there are opportunities that the commission could take advantage of to, to pursue some of the, um, the issues uh, related to research that are outside of the 
necessarily of, of, of public hearings per se. So especially with PSU and probably U of O. Thanks, Mike. Um, Oriana. So what I'm thinking about right now, I was really sparked by the idea of like process. And I'm struggling because I don't know that we are the right bodies for this process of documenting histories that have been underrepresented or unrepresented or erased. Uh, and I think uh, Steph brought up kind of this idea of harm in history. Uh, and I'm gonna go a little bit harder on that particular idea of what does it mean for mostly white or exclusively white bodies uh, that are designed in kind of white supremacist structures uh, or structures to uphold white supremacy more accurately say, like to preserve history and define who gets to be historical and who doesn't. Like that process is, even if it's not intentionally harmful, has some of the elements built in that I think in order to really count it for. And I think thinking about, is it right for our bodies to do this work? Or is it right to have community process or participatory action research or some way for the communities whose history is intended to be preserved to have their process and have it have equal, if not more weight than the, the structures that have been in place for a long time that have mostly preserved landmarks and spaces that have upheld exclusion, that have upheld discrimination, that uphold mostly white history. And that is not to say that those spaces are inherently bad, but that we, I think, have to account for that. We can't just say, oh, we're going to do better now and have legacy businesses and have uh, a um, audit of East of 82nd. Like, we have to really think about how do we change the process itself if we're going to do this in a meaningful way and who should have the voice in this process. And I, I think my, my general sense is that it may not be us. Thank you, Ariana. Um, um, I sort of actually had a question related to what Ariana just brought up um, and was wondering, Brandon, I think you spoke about a potential grant uh, for this kind of work or maybe looking into one, but I was just uh, thinking how you know, if, if there was to be a grant for this kind of work, like how do you structure that? So it, uh, it it's, uh, yeah, it's an approach where we have, um, and I don't know, like um, community-based organizations that can work with the city of Portland or that are interested in the first place to work on projects like this to sort of, uh, map their places that um, they feel like are um, historic places. So I was also just wondering on processes and how this has been done before. And um, from a quick sort of search online of a project like this, I couldn't find really anything to model after or best practices of other cities that have um, sort of done this. So I just want to um, a comment for even having this as an issue to look into in a potential project. Um, um, yeah. I, I'm thrilled both Commissioner McNair and, and our new commissioner, Commissioner McWilliams raised this, this question and it's one that, that I think staff have wrestled with, I have wrestled with, and I, and I do agree that this, and I think even Chair Minor raised it, that many of these conversations can't be a BPS led initiative without a, a deep and trusting partnership with communities for whom we may not have those relationships. Um, we have had some really good successes on a small scale working with individual properties within the African-American Historic Sites umbrella. Um, the, three, the three properties that we're currently working with, two of them are black owned and that was a request from the, the owners to have city assistance to partner uh, with, a, with a diverse team of, of consultants to get the nominations right, but to also have a mutual exchange of, of knowledge. So we're, we're, we're playing with that as a, a step in the direction, which I think we still have many more steps to go. Um, and then thinking about the LGBTQ um, AI, you know, uh, approach to designations, it is something that's coming from several people who for long, um, you know, for long, long in their histories have been working to document 
um, their own lived experience and stories and who are now seeing that um, people who's, who have important stories are passing and, and buildings and places are being displaced or demolished. And so both of those efforts are really coming from people in the community. Now, that being said, I think this is an area where the PSC's guidance, maybe direction in your letter or just a continued elevation of the, the lack of trust in these relationships and the longstanding harm that's been done is gonna be a really helpful one to, to give staff better direction and guidance on how to, to continue to move in a, in a good direction um, where we, we screw up and we also learn and we continue to figure out how best we deploy the resources. One of the, one of the positives when we do get grant dollars is that we have more nimbleness in, in delegating who is doing the research, who's getting paid from those grant resources and that may be an area we can explore further too so that the resources go to those people whose histories are being documented. Um, that's, I was going to follow up on that question is whether um, how much discretion you have when you apply for the grants to not perhaps be clear at that time which stories will be told through them and who would get the contracts. Do you have the flexibility um, to bring the funds in and figure, you know, and, and let community lead the next steps? It, it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's grant specific. Um, in the case of the three sites that we're working with, um, that are the um, Golden West Hotel, Dean's Barbershop, and Mount Olivet Baptist Church. In that case, we have a, a historian, Kim Moreland, who's working with the historic preservation professional team uh, on each of the nominations in hope of, of pairing lived experience and, and technical experience so that in the future, we've got more people who are um, have the skills and the resume to, to take on National Register nominations that, that reflect their individual lived history. And so that's one where we're, um, we're hoping that the partnership can give us somebody uh, who we can continue to work with in the future on nominations that reflect their story. But it's in the grant applications, I think this, this conversation may be a few steps ahead of where the grantors are at and thinking about where the dollars go. Thank you. I'll share a couple thoughts, really piggybacking on Oriana's um, that, um, I mean, I think she's made the two, two point, two levels. One is how things get initiated and historically, these districts, I think, began with some group of people passing the hat, you know, to raise funds, to hire consultants, to document, and, and that clearly is going to bias in favor of affluent white communities, and their stories are more likely to get approved and go through the approval process for this national historic districts. Um, so that's a problem, and I think in that way, um, we've preserved too much of, of some stories. Um, and then we have, um, in terms of elevating other stories, um, it takes resources and decision making coming from um, from groups that are not represented right now. Um, and we, we did have the expanding opportunities for affordable housing where the city solicited input from um, faith communities and others to um, who wanted to put affordable housing on their property. Um, it was funded through Metro grant. Um, there may be a way to even um, give more control to local communities. I'd, I'd love to see that get explored. Um, in terms of who makes the decision on approving a district in terms of land use decisions, this, this project shifts that from Landmarks Commission to the Planning Sustainability Commission. Um, if there's a proposal to shift it to another body um, that would be more reflective, that would be, I mean, that's almost for this project, um, frankly. Um, but um, I, I, don't, I don't know what that would be, but that would be a, an interesting idea is to figure out if there's a, a way that the approval actually would go to a, a more representative body, um, if such a body would exist. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for my thoughts. Any other responses or thoughts? I want to get a sense us, from, yeah. oh yeah, Brandon, yeah, move us forward if, if, you, if you like, or if you want to give us an idea of how, many, how much resources this is in the big picture, share that. I, well, two things, and I'll measure three is related, so I think it'll just keep the conversation going. Um, I'm not sure this is a one and done issue. So one thing that is true is, over time, as we have new communities move to the city, over time, as communities and stories get longer and more, more diverse, um, there may be a continuing role for focusing on those histories that have been underrepresented. It may look different 30 years from now than it does today. But when we look at our citywide roster of landmarks and districts, the inequity is, is clear. And so I think as we've been thinking about this, we've probably been using an equity lens, thinking about, okay, where do we need to prioritize uh, different histories that have been excluded? And I think where the planning commission is going in this conversation is how do we do better than that and think, think through our justice lens 
and what would what would look different in, in the process and then the decision making chain. Um, and I think that's a really exciting concept for us to be, you know, as a white project manager wrestling with and coming up with how does that look and, and how do we how do we not just do better but but do the best we can do and try and learn along the way. Thank you. Um Kat. I'll just quickly say, and Brandon, you said that well, to me, our letter would be more about the work that needs to be done to figure out what that process needs to be going forward versus kind of specifically stating we need to go address these communities and these things. Like we just need to recognize this isn't happening. So how, do, how, does, how does this get prioritized going forward? And some, somebody needs to figure that out. And I think it's all tied into our equity work in general. And how, does it, how is it done appropriately? I'll leave it at that. Just summarizing really what you all said, I think just trying to tie it back to the letter specifically. Thank you. I'm gonna move us Chair Spivak since issue three is related. Um, that issue was raised by a number of commissioners and really think about designations with so landmarks, districts, areas that are subject to land use regulations in the code, but, but designations will be just part of what, what is the historic resource inventory, which, which may include places that are documented for their stories that have informational value, but that are not appropriate for land use protection, whether it's because an owner is uh, objecting to a designation, which is allowed under Oregon law, whether the, the tenants or the community at large um, has other visions for the property, their thoughts about development potential or use of the property, um, or if it's, it's not um, the right long-term approach to protecting the history to preserve a resource. So the inventory becomes a much larger and more nimble living document that does include those landmarks and districts that have land use protection, but also other things. The, the last time um, the city comprehensively updated the inventory was in 1984, something that the Historic Landmarks Commission has requested uh, be prioritized for a long time. These, uh, these code amendments open the door to allowing those updates. Uh, individual landmark designations, district designations, surveys of historic resources that don't result in landmark or district designations, all of that information could in the future come onto the historic resource inventory and give us a really big opportunity to think about actually updating it and being comprehensive and thoughtful. And so in addition to those, those designation uh, concepts identified in the last issue, there really are large geographic areas in the city, or thematic areas in the city's past, the recent past, uh, much of East Portland, much of North Portland that have not been inventoried. And to an issue that was raised by Commissioner Backrack a few weeks ago, internally we know that there's room to improve the map and the database of historic resources not only for, for development teams, but also for the interested public to conduct research, to learn about their stories and other stories citywide. And we do have some envy of our, our counterparts in, in Washington DC, New York, and San Francisco, who all have um, sort of much more robust databases and maps for, for the researcher uh, who is looking to learn about either a site that may be a development opportunity or a history that is um, told in the built environment, but that map and database component is needed to know it. So I'll pause there. And um, I think it's related to issue two. So we can spend as long or as little on this as the commission wants. Thank you, Brandon. Any thoughts on this one? I'm not seeing hands, so let's proceed. So the fourth issue, this is one that Commissioner, I uh, see Chair Schultz has, or Commissioner Schultz had her hand up for a brief moment, so I don't know if you want to jump in or. Do you want to jump in? I, I'm just going to say I don't know how. Uh, I think this has got to be one of the things to poke at in our letter. I don't know how Brandon or anybody in historic resources can be doing their work with an outdated HRI list. So for me, this is it's pretty high up there on the list of things that we need to uh, recommend that needs to happen. Uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, again, a part of it may be a discussion of also sooner rather than later is what is that process to make sure it's inclusive as it should be and equitable, but it's, and it is tied together, but I think it's it's high up there. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Kat. So one other issue that was raised and, and these are just, I uh, would, uh, would say that um, we're, th we're throwing out opportunities for potential future work based upon testimony received, not that there's any bureau priority to do these things, but they, they 
I think warranted identification here. Uh, we do have several areas that um, historic conservation districts that use approval criteria that were developed in the 1970s, 80s, or 90s, no longer represent best practice, that have material lists that are not available any longer, or that provide prescriptive paths for development that is um, more complex or more conservative than would otherwise be approvable. One of those areas, as I mentioned, was the South Portland Historic District. Those guidelines date to 1977 and provide a number of regulatory hurdles for applicants who are building a new building or doing an addition. And so we are in the process using a metro, uh, metro grant to update those guidelines. It's a pretty narrow effort when compared to creating new guidelines at a whole cloth or for a larger district. But we have heard a number of, of uh, people in the public, <clears throat> both in the design overlay zone amendments project and in this project, uh, request an update or polishing to the conservation district design standards. I think as commissioners remember, unlike historic districts, conservation districts allow for a clear and objective path for alterations, additions, and new construction. Um, those standards were first adopted in 1993, and there is quite a bit of room to, to improve those standards uh, following up on the DOZA project. Uh, we also have slides addition design guidelines dates in 1988 and do limit or provide some um, design guidance that is limiting for the, the potential to add development opportunity, middle housing types. Um, that does not make it impossible, but that we, we could see improvements to those design guidelines, creating a much simpler path or straightforward path for designers. And I, I'm going to mention Irvington. Irvington is the city's largest historic district. It does not have design guidelines. And so when new construction alterations and additions are proposed in Irvington today, those projects uh, are reviewed against approval criteria that also apply to landmark buildings. So it's a pretty uh, rigorous process in Irvington. Irvington has been a historic district now for 11 years. And so that's been the case the whole time. Again, it's not to say that staff would, would prioritize any of these items um, other than just to flag what we heard from testimony and over the last couple of years. Thank you. Um, any questions on this one? Um, Chair Minor. Thank you. I don't, I don't have a whole lot to add other than um, to, to, to look at conservation district design standards. Um, that is one that I think could really help inform um, you know, the strategy for those districts. Right now, um, we have, I mean, I guess we have standards and then just, you know, the, the um, you know, what's really happening, you know, on the ground. And those two things are, are not very well aligned. And so I think my commission would really love to be able to, you know, help with refining conservation district design standards. I mean, yes, you know, it's great to have standards or guidelines, should I say, for every district. Um, I think I described in the three by three what that process was, you know, when when somebody wants to build something and you have to sort of analyze the district before you can, you know, sort of come up with what's most important visually and guidelines do that for you, you know, so really it helps the applicant and it helps staff and it helps the decision-making body a lot. Um, but the conservation district standards, I just have to say, they're really outdated. They're not working well. So um, I, I'd love to see those um, working better for all of those different districts. Thanks. Thank you. Any other items on this one? I'll, I'll chime in briefly on it. I, I think that since these processes, the, the staffing of it is paid by citywide, I'm, I'm less excited about um, individual area designations, even though it might be helpful to review projects in them. Um, it's, a, it's an ongoing cost for people, even if they live far from any district, they're paying for it um, in part. So that makes it harder to make for me that case. Um, for the, um, I have done a project with um, the Conservation district standards, I, I agree, they're, they're not great. I, I guess the question for me is, are those current ones, um, they're not great, are they thwarting development? Are they causing people 
to need to go through a discretionary process because they can't comply. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the impact is on development. Um, I, I understand the impact, the, the aesthetic kind of people not being happy by projects get approved through those, um, but I don't know whether it's actually impinging development. So I, I would kind of want some information on that to figure out how much to focus on on that. Although I, I, I do agree, it would be good to rework them. Um, I'm not sure what the um, upside downside of doing so is. Um, Valeria? Yeah, um, for the lots addition decide guidelines, Brendan, you mentioned that, you know, uh, updating that could potentially provide the ability to um, have some ADUs or the, uh, or uh, 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 yeah, to create um, potential, uh, potentially more housing like ADU, some, some middle housing. Um, I think the only thing about that is that, you know, I don't think that the ADUs that will be uh, offered in last edition will be affordable and are the kind of housing that we, or I would think that the city is trying to um, support for. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but that just popped in my head as, you know, uh, for who this would benefit. And so I think I just want to sort of keep that perspective as I at least prioritize the issues on my end. Oh, sorry, I said, I said thank you. And Kat, you're next. And then Oriana. Sorry, I had myself on mute. This might be a somewhat of a question for Brandon, but where my head's gone is, as we've now created these tiers of districts, um, you know, where does LADS addition and, and these other areas, just picking on LADS addition, since we were talking about it, end up landing in those tiers. And maybe, maybe we need to get through that to make sure that we're comfortable that everything, everything's kind of in a spot it needs to be in and then think about what that means for design standards or guidelines for any of these districts from that point. Like it's kind of part and parcel, it seems to me. And I'll jump in on that real quick, just to remind the, the commission, every, we took with this project, a sort of safe harbor approach with the map, just to, to not have scope kind of break the project, but also to, to tackle things one step at a time. And so anything that's today a conservation district will remain regulated as a conservation district. Anything that today is a historic district remains regulated as a historic district. With the exception of historic districts that were recently listed in the National Register, they dropped down to the lowest tier of protection National Register level, uh, which is a change. But following the code amendments, the city council would have the ability to, to move the protection levels up and down. So if there was a conservation district that for whatever reason in the future, city council found would be better uh, protected at the historic level, higher level of protections, they could do that. Conversely, if there's a historic district today that would be better uh, approached as a conservation district, that level of protection could change. And so once these code amendments are, are codified, that that path opens up to have that discussion. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Oriana? Yeah, building off of, I think, the really good point that Valeria made, uh, I wonder um, whether as we kind of think about these design guidelines, especially for conservation districts or LADS edition, we think about what are the values that we're wanting to imbue in some of these changes in the neighborhood by allowing ADUs, if that's creating more below market rate housing, do we add some sort of affordability requirement? Or can we utilize, like in particular conservation districts, which are in a lot of um, historically black neighborhoods in Portland, at least uh, the ones I'm thinking of off the top of my head, like Kenton and the Albina area, how do we make sure that the design guidelines are updated in ways that really preserve the history that's been kind of cut out of those neighborhoods? Uh, and sorry, my dog is barking in the background, but that's where my head goes, is, is really thinking about values and kind of coming back to some of the conversations we had around DOZA and, and where we put that piece in. Thank you. Valeria, is your hand back up? Or is it so? That's all right. We all do that. <laughs> Great. Um, anyone else want to chime in on this one? And I'll say one thing, Charles, you back, and that's yeah. it at the staff level, at least with, with me and, and my colleagues on the urban design team. There's a bang for the buck with the conservation district design standards, in that as we allow middle housing types effective August 1st in the single dwelling zones, which there are there are considerable amounts of the conservation district that are single dwelling zones. 
that there may be some some easy lifts following the Doza project to get those standards to be workable, responsive, um, and to provide the type of flexibility that Commissioner Magnera is, is talking about, which we have some design standards that are more restrictive than need be to protect the integrity of the neighborhood um, in terms of the, the you know, architectural and cultural history that there's, there's quite a few areas that we could loosen up and still achieve a, a preservation result. Um, also, the one thing with the conservation district design standards is um, as, a, as we imagine in some future reality, new conservation districts coming along, the design standards that exist today are, are really focused on late 1800s, early 1900s architecture, and some surgical changes to those could really open the door for something different. Thanks. Bigger lift, bigger lift, think about Irvington, Lads Edition. Are you, are you saying that there is a, a project where this would come up, or just as we learn lessons from implementation of RIP, we may come up with some surgical changes to the community design standards to recommend it wouldn't be a big project? I think it um, it would it would still require a legislative procedure, but as this both in those a project and this project, this is one that staff have identified that would be a if there were appetite or interest or capacity. This is one that we if we're looking at design approaches, this would be a logical place to start the design standards. Okay, thank you. Well, let's go to the next. So I'm keeping, I got just a couple more and, and I saved, I think the most interesting and outside of our comfort zone ones for last. One thing that's come up a lot the last 18 months um, is the idea of historic preservation programs that, that leave Title 33 and leave the official zoning map and move into the realm of intangible or living history. Um, we have three American cities that are experimenting with legacy business and cultural district programs. San Francisco really has been the emergent example of um, trial and error around legacy business and cultural district programs, where a mix of responsive regulations and um, funding, both grant funding, um, property tax abatements, other sources of tax incentives, are deployed in service of communities or institutions who are vulnerable to displacement. And San Francisco, San Antonio, and now Seattle are experimenting with legacy business programs that are additive to their historic resource programs. So sometimes legacy businesses happen to be in a landmark. Sometimes legacy businesses happen to be in a district, not always. And they're coming up with some pretty uh, interesting lessons learned about how best to approach those types of living history programs, who benefits, who's burdened by those, whether or not there's a, a sort of cocktail of, of policy approaches that work best. Um, we have not done this in the city of Portland. Uh, we did have a former landmarks commissioner, Commissioner Spears, who really raised the, the alarm that there was a need here, an opportunity here to think about displacement, primarily in, in the conversations we had last year around businesses and primarily uh, BIPOC owned businesses here in the community around what could the city do creatively to protect those places. Uh, there's certainly interest across multiple city bureaus, not just planning bureau, Prosper Portland, BDS, uh, council offices certainly are interested in this, uh, but it is one that that today there's not um, there's not a, a vision or a project that's queued up to look at legacy businesses and cultural districts. So it's one that we wanted to put on the table for discussion today. It probably falls into a similar camp that Commissioner McNair was talking about earlier. You know, how do we approach it? What's the process look like? Who takes the lead? Um, these are, I think, really good and big questions, but one I think nonetheless it has a growing amount of energy behind. Thank you. Any comments on this? Um, Katie? Yeah, I love this idea. And um, I, I'd really like to see uh, the city do something about these. It comes up all the time in East Portland. Um, and um, there's a lot of interest in in markets and restaurant rows, et cetera, et cetera, that would be um, you know, representative of different groups, some of which are have just come to the city that are new. So, um, yeah, this is this is something that uh, so many people are interested in. All right, thank you, um, Tristan. I I wanted to say thank you to um, the commissioner who raised that you know, perhaps not everything is best done by our two commissions in some cases. And this 
Um, while I think that there are opportunities for us to push this forward and perhaps play a part, I am not sure, you know, this belongs necessarily, you know, in the entire bailiwick of either one of our commissions. Um, I was, I definitely participated and sort of learned about some other cities when Derek Spears was, was spearheading, you know, trying to get this off the ground. And of course, you know, you run into the issues right off the bat of, you know, whose bureau does it sit in and, you know, whose fiefdom, you know, and, and, and I think that raising it to city council um, could really get that decision making, you know, <laughs> done in terms of who should run with this, because I think that's, you know, there are a lot of lessons learned from other cities that, that we, you know, would do well to, to understand. Um, but I think it's a great program. I mean, you know, just looking at the range of them, that is, um, we, we certainly have learned a lot through the pandemic about the importance of community anchors. And so this would be a perfect program for, you know, recovery. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Oriana? So what I'm thinking about in this, this particular piece and maybe building off of um, earlier thoughts is like not just who preserves and who decides what is and is not history, but what is history? For many communities, history and living history is people and not necessarily structures. And it may also not be stick built structures. Uh, where are the preservation opportunities for manufactured housing communities like the Oak Leaf, which is the first uh, nonprofit owned kind of community owned manufactured housing community in the city of Portland. That is, and Cully has a number of manufactured housing communities that have rich history, um, that have their special preservation through land use decisions that went through uh, this body before my time. But how do we how do we create that preservation as well? Or similarly for tiny homes, like I've thought a lot about the intersection between this project and the shelter to housing continuum with the conversations that have come up about Hazelnut Grove and some of the stability there, the library in that community is an incredibly beautiful building that I would say has some architectural significance. So I think we have to have, we, we think about living history, think about both like what, what is history and how do we preserve it? Um, and what is a landmark and stretch our idea of that, but also stretch our idea of what is history from a community stability perspective. And how do we really leverage cultural districts or legacy businesses in the way that I think Katie was was getting at of preserving communities, preserving landmarks to the community itself as it is living in this current moment. And similarly, how do we utilize kind of going back to my, my first point, um, the harm that may be done with just the idea of history and who has written it and how it has been defined to build a reparative element. Can we create some sort of fee associated with living in a historic district like Irvington or Laurelhurst Ooh. that then has some reparative uh, element? And that was my dog, Cinnamon, who has strong feelings about land use, um, but some reparative element, reparations for cultural districts or communities that are, are trying to be stable and preserved who have been constantly pushed out of uh, communities and opportunities through redlining, but then now through just other displacement practices. So I hope that as we think about this particular issue, we think really creatively and really think about what are the problems of what history means and what it means to think about history from a future perspective as well. Um, what will be history? What, what do we want to not be history because it's in the past, but because it is like a long arc that is has like a really solid um, solid shape to it that we have helped to preserve instead of just something that happened that we're now trying to like hold on to in the present. Thank you. Um, Valeria? I had my hand up, but Orian already covered some of the points I was going to bring up. Thank you. Oriana, you just maybe get, got me thinking about how, I mean, there are, if you look through the overlap of TIF districts and historic areas, you might find somewhere um, there could be money you know, raised in within the the um, the large residential portion of a TIF district could be spent um, outside that through a Prosper Legacy program. Oriana? Yeah, I would just to respond to you, I was totally thinking about the Cully TIF district and what Verde and Living Cully are trying to do with that. I think there's a lot of opportunity for a similar kind of creative model here. Thanks. Um, well, let's go on to the next one. 
the next one is one I'll 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 probably defer to Chair Minor to to talk through. Um, the idea that came out of the Landmarks Commission discussion a few weeks ago was the idea of a, a historic resource strategic plan or a, a cultural resources plan, um, a document that that essentially provides this future work discussion in, in writing, maybe providing technical assistance to owners or, or background details. Other cities do prepare historic preservation strategic plans. Um, we we have a comprehensive plan that provides us policy guidelines or guidance on um, where we may go in the future. Uh, we have not in recent years completed a historic preservation plan in, in part because it's sort of a internal cost benefit analysis. And we've got really good direction from the community. Uh, we do have a sense of work that needs to get done. But I do think the Landmarks Commission has raised some um, opportunity here with preservation planning in a, in a more formalized or strategic way. And so maybe I'll, I'll let Chair Minor talk about what this issue is. Great, thank you so much. I, I want to back up a second and just say, you know, this this process has has been a really interesting one. It's really taught me a lot about the planning commission, and um, maybe kind of the areas of overlap that we have between our two commissions. Um, I have to say, I mean, I'm actually kind of shocked. <laughs> to see that we have a lot of areas of possible collaboration. Um, but I also see that there's a lot of diffuse energy out there in terms of you know, how to prioritize next steps. Historic preservation definitely um, is complicated. It's misunderstood maybe um, by some. And I think it needs to change. Um, you know, my commission and you know what what we do can do better. Um, I think we can do better at defining priorities. So you know, just like reserving the most intensive and you know material materially authentic and fussy, if you will. Um, reviews for those historic buildings and places that really deserve it. But then below that, there sits an entire realm of, of more flexible, adaptive reuse policy um, that gets at equity, that gets at um, sustainability. And, you know, yes, we can, I, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, where those threads leave lead, but we keep coming back to the idea of just, you know, there's so much out there, it would be so helpful to have it, um, you know, sort of codified in a, in a document that, you know, again, you know, like your, there's, there's many documents that get updated, you know, as needed. But a historic preservation plan could really include just the data, um, the policy direction, and then prioritize the city's efforts. Some of the things that we've already talked about today could fall within this plan. You know, how does the city create a process for um, supporting, you know, neighborhoods that haven't had preservation really before, or you know, engage them, um, and then just to sort of recognize the relationship between preservation and things like displacement, sustainability, affordability. Um, anyway, that's that's just where I think we're coming from is to, you know, to find a way to prioritize all this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, are there other people want to chime in on this one? Okay, well, we got a good overview there. Um, and do you want to take us? Is there one more? Do I remember that right? There's one more, but it's it's something of an obvious one. Um, so I think there were, there were other issues that the landmarks commissioners had raised, other issues that commissioners had mentioned to me. What I'd like to do, I know we're at 635 and it's beautiful outside here in Portland. And I don't want to keep us long, but what I'd like to do is just to, to talk a little bit about uh, maybe a 
priority or priorities that I, I failed to mention or that weren't, were not raised previously by commissioners. So anything else that, that really needs to be part of our discussion tonight. And then look to you, Chair Spivak, to help me um, get a sense of if, if the PSC members can arrive at your sort of top one, two, three, four, you know, it's a short list of things that you'd like to put in, in your letter. I think Landmarks Commission certainly will be testifying to council on these amendments, um, carving out some space for that future work discussion there as well. But I, I think we would be really well served to leave tonight with, with the short list for your letter to council that are resonating with people and anything that I have failed to bring forward as a PSC priority. All right, well, thanks. I'm gonna ask my commissioners to help out on this. Um, Perhaps we could do a, a one to two minute go round of, of anything that they, and, and if it's already been shared, then just <clears throat> say that um, in terms of things you would like to convey to the city council in our, in our accompanying letter. Um, if, if people are okay with, I can't see everybody on my screen at once, but um, if, if people are okay with that, I would ask someone to volunteer to, to start, start that off. Kat. Well, I could start it off by somewhat re-summarizing what I've already said. So first of all, I think I, I think it's the letter needs to recognize the importance that, that perhaps Kristen was kind of just expressing that historic places um, have in our community and need to need to continue to have and have more emphasis put onto it. And that this is a work that is more than just our commission. It's it's an entire community. We need to think about how to make sure that we move forward in these processes in a more equitable way and recognize a number of different communities and histories. And um, and and part of that, then that I would go back to. Um, and so there needs to be funding put towards understanding the process better. And then the next thing is you got to start start by identifying the places that you want to preserve and that the H historic resources um, list HRI needs to be updated. So to me, it's like you, you kind of take everything we've just talked about tonight and it's a broad comment in our letter about the importance of all of that. I, I don't know that we're necessarily prioritizing all those things as saying um, there's, there's a big scope of work here, at least in my opinion. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, Mike. Yeah, I'll just say being a lame duck here, I'll take a cultural landscapes off the table. I keep bringing it up. Um, and just simply say that I think there are other ways to deal with some of these issues, this one in particular. And in fact, I helped write a chapter on cultural landscapes in the regional conservation strategy through the Intertwine Alliance. So I see that there's an avenue of, of our independently pursuing that work with Judy Bluehorse Skelton at PSU and others for the indigenous, uh, re-indigenizing the landscape. And of course, the areas like West Hayden Island, Ross Island and so forth. And maybe someday we'll come back to you all <laughs> with a proposal and how to how to uh, how to how to proceed to recognize those landscapes. And Mike, you'll be ha happy to know that that in my role, we've been coordinating more with parks than we have in, in at least recent memory on a several historic preservation cultural landscape issues um, with, a, with a variety of interested parties. So I think there's there's internal gears that are moving more now than they were even a few months ago on, on these discussions. Great, good to hear that, thanks. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Valeria? Yeah, I think that um, number five, legacy business and cultural district programs, out of any of them really stands out for me based on uh, the level of impact uh, that it provides for the community and um, in a shorter, it, yeah, to me, I think that it could be more of a short term rather than long term thinking about the other projects. So like, you know, if, if I'm just thinking again about impact and, and the timeline of that. And to me, it seems like number five creates a very, uh, tangible impact in different ways. And also its timeline could be shorter than um, other projects. Uh, so that's, if I don't know that I can prioritize, like, I don't know if we need to give our top three, but that's just something that I, at least I want to elevate a little bit more. Thank you. Um Yeah. 
Chris, and then after Chris, Katie, and then Jeff. So I think I see some opportunities for bundling in this list. To me, two, three, and five look like they're all aspects of capturing things that we have you know, historically missed uh, when we talk about you know, the, the city's history. Um, and I very much agree with the idea that, that much of this should be community led rather than uh, you know, bureau led. Uh, but I think even if that's true, we still need to the extent that some of them may touch um, the inventory or the code we're going to need bureau resources to incorporate those. So I'd I'd love to you know, sort of capture that combination of things as making sure we make space for things that we have historically neglected or failed to recognize um, as a theme. So my two cents. Thanks, um, Katie. Oh, yeah, I'm just, um, I kind of wanted to put in a plug for the Historic Resources Strategic Plan, um, just because the conversation that we've had, it's just been our conversation, and it seems to me that it's, um, it, it really is, you know, I mean, it does make sense to have a plan. Um, and then the other things is just, uh, I, I kind of went through earlier and like numbered, renumbered mine, and um, Number five, I put as number two, because to me, that is like a development project. That would be, it's like living history. And 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 I mean, I just think that would be glorious if we could do that. Um, and then number three is um, phase citywide historic resource. Well, wait a minute. That, okay. That one I numbered four, three, I numbered four. And um, number two, I numbered three. So one was six, two was five, three was two, and four, and number four was three. I could send that in to you. See, Brandon, but anyway, those were my priorities. Here. Those were all things that are new work that but would be, if you, um, you might want to send that history to other, um, to all of Portland. And that's all. Thank you. Um, let's go to Jeff. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, set a little context for my comments. We're talking about what goes in a letter to city council when we forward our package of the historic code review. And so I, I think to have some impact, we have to be careful not to do two things. One is here's you know 16 great ideas. We wanna see funding from the city council because I think that dilutes any message. And so uh, I, I'd like the notion that a couple of people mentioned, Valerie mentioned it again, impact and timeline. Where can we make some really discreet comments to city council and not be so broad and so massive that I don't think we have any impact in our letter? So in terms of, and, and the other comment I want to make is, and, and as I thought about Kat, what you were saying about the importance of all these elements of our historic the history of the city and how we address them. Uh, I don't know what message we're giving council. Are we saying we feel these elements of the historic review are more important than uh, sustainability and climate action? Are we saying they're more important than housing? What, what, are we, what are we saying when we go, wow, historic resources are really, really important. I, I think we have to be careful and give a little prioritization or guidance to city council. Otherwise, everything we do sounds really, really important and everything we do warrants more follow-up work. So we just did a massive historic review project. I don't know if we want to be telling the city council and now we need to immediately embark on another one. So I, I, this may be a wordsmithing or editing issue, but uh, I think when we're communicating with council, we ought to give some bookends. We ought to give some sense of What's the key message we're telling them and not just be so broad that it, it, it doesn't land. So back to impact and timeline. I like number one as a, I think it could be a focused, strategic, relatively modest project, good impact, good timeline, get it done. And then I think I agree with, I think what Chris said, a couple of these issues, two and five, 
I think could be combined, big impact, longer timeline, but seem to me in this climate of, of concern about historically underrepresented communities, we, we, we could at least touch on that as a, a longer term, high impact undertaking to, to look for the opportunity to, to do it and fund it sometime in the future. Thank, Thank you, you. Jeff. Um, Steph. Um, I think of, I guess I'm thinking of a couple of things. One is, you know, what is this bureau's role and what is the PSC's role, uh, to Oriana's earlier comment, and what is a citywide priority um, for, for us as a city? And uh, when I think of what, what the role is, I've heard that historic resource inventory, um, conservation district, district standards are important to be able to do as, as kind of a, the base of a soup, you know, to do the, uh, the fundamental ongoing work. Um, but when I think of the city priority, um, it is absolutely legacy business and cultural district programs and, um, and looking to underrepresented histories. I think, again, back to our initial briefing, uh, if you'll remember, we shared that briefing uh, for the kickoff of the Historic Resources Code Project with um, a briefing of the Albina Vision Plan and that there are communities doing this work and that um, for us, our role, um, at least how I heard uh, Oriana's earlier comment was, uh, is, is support um, potentially as, as uh, encouragement or getting out of the way and so but and and recognizing that some of these are across bureaus um, and um, uh, across communities and um, and that that is a critical priority that doesn't just live with us but it needs to live on thank you um, Oriana so I think kind of similar to Chris, I don't see these things as mutually exclusive. And I think this actually looks a little bit more like a work plan to me in some ways than um, necessarily a list of things where we have to pick a few of what goes in the letter. And the way I'll try to thread the needle, and I'm happy to put this in an email if it resonates with folks, is I think our first step is to do this strategic plan. To, that's like the goal here. The lens for that is designation of underrepresented histories. And kind of to Steph's point and a point that Valeria made earlier, we can do so first through an inventory and that can happen with community-based organizations or neighborhood groups or just communities deciding what's important to them and doing like a citywide exploration, maybe not through a typical uh, historic resources inventory, but a broader sense of what history means to different communities, the kinds of things they'd like to see preserved, uh, just get a sense of that and do that, that sort of inventory. Uh, so then doing that lens, you can build a strategic plan that includes the designation of legacy businesses or cultural districts if that seems like that meets the needs of community. Because I think that's the, the second piece is first identifying like, what does history mean? Second, or, uh, what is important to community and then like what, what how do they want to preserve what does preservation mean um or or what does history mean and how does that go into that future again that idea of like this arc and and keeping it from being interrupted but sustained community stability over time like is that what history should mean uh and legacy businesses and cultural districts may be a tool for that but that may also not be what community wants and through that, you can also define the uh, guidelines and standards or zoning map requirements or kind of some of these other elements, maybe sub pieces of a strategic plan. But I think the last one, um, like I really hear Kristen and excitement about the opportunities for our bodies to collaborate. And I don't wanna lose that, but I think there's resonance I'm hearing between a number of folks on this body around doing this work in a more community led way and maybe allowing community to decide what do they want our bodies to, to be within that process? How does that partnership look or, or what role do we play versus do we not serve a purpose anymore in terms of the way community wants to define and preserve history in, in the future? So hopefully that made some sense. Again, if there's resonance, I'm happy to kind of like 
work that into something that can be added to to a letter. But I see a lot of strong links here. And I think ultimately the lens is like, re, not just designation of underrepresented histories, but redefining history and defining history in a community forward, community led, community visioned way. Thank you. <clears throat> I will, don't see any more hands up, um, new ones at least. So I'm gonna um, jump in with, I'll, I'll be, I think very short and sweet. I, I think that, um, we should spend, we spend too much energy preserving some histories and not enough preserving others, um, supporting others. So that goes to me, numbers one and two, um, and maybe informed by three. Um, that's my, so I actually kind of like the, the order that has been laid out in front of us. Um, I think that, you know, I think we also need to balance this, the big picture. I mean, there are ways within the historic preservation program to further equity and climate goals, but I'm not sure the opportunities how, how that stacks up against opportunities for us to achieve those um, those goals through other entirely different projects that the staff's juggling staff time for. Um, and so I hope that um, as city council is balancing this, they figure out okay, how much staff energy goes into historic preservation versus how much staff energy goes into other entire, entirely different fields of work. Um, and on collaboration, I totally agree. We need, I mean, we haven't yet had our first designated area come to the PSC. I mean, that can't happen until this project is completed. So I think that we need to um, under, and, and, and hopefully it'll come be one that comes out of community. Um, so I think that that is something that we'll be um, field testing um, and, and we'll inevitably, I think we'll, we'll need to, to collaborate more closely. And for those who don't know, I, I, um, the chairs of the planning, design and historic commissions do meet quarterly, um, but there may need to be something more um, involved in that, especially as we start um, needing their input um, along with communities input as real projects come before us. Um, and I'll, I'll throw my last bias out here is that I, I, I'm a bigger fan of historic landmarks than I am of districts. Um, I think that one of the concerns I have about um, the historic use of historic districts is that they absorb a lot of staff time and they rely not only on project reviews but also updating things over and that's, that's absorbing city resources. So I, I have a sense of how much um, time gets used in what's ultimately gonna be a small part of the city. Um, so I will leave it at that for my thoughts. Does anyone wanna jump in after you've heard everyone on the go round to have any more synthesizing thoughts? Jeff, is your hand up new or old? Looks like probably old. Oh, that's old. Okay. That's old. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, any more thoughts? Okay, well, um, I see Katie, perhaps. Just really quick, I, uh, Oriana had offered, and I just wanted to say what she was saying sounded great to me, and I'd love to take her up on it. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, I'm gonna need some assistance from staff on when this will continue to. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair Spivak. Thank you, everybody. I know this is a, a explorative discussion and I actually am, am really thankful to have been part of it. I think I have learned something along the way tonight. And I, th I think we can come up with a letter that reflects the discussion tonight that makes clear the priorities without falling, you know, kind of falling prey to the too much is overwhelming strategy. So we're going to, uh, Chair Spivak, you'll need to continue us to April 27th. We will be coming back April 27th with the amendments package as requested. And so over the course of the next month, some of you will hear from me to run language by you. Others uh, were very clear with the request and so we won't need to do that. The thinking being when we come back in April on the 27th, uh, you will have had a week or so to review the amendments. And since we straw polled with each amendment uh, that was discussed, I'm, I'm hoping and we'll see that that could be our evening for a recommendation out of PSC with the slate of changes to make a recommended draft. That sounds great. Do you think it's worth trying to get a, a draft letter by that discussion time? Let let's let's have that conversation. Maybe that. we could pass it on to officers. Yeah, we'll we'll okay. it would be ideal, but we'll see. Well, thank you. Well, thanks so much, Brandon, for leading us through this. I will continue the meeting to April 27th for this topic. And with that, we are adjourned.